I'm sure everybody knows me. I'm Jessica Stoner with the, the Jessica Stoner Real Estate Team with Remax Alpine Realty here in Canmore. You guys may be familiar with my team. We have Nathan, <laughs> Nathan Weema here, and uh, Natalie Hudik. And we are very, very lucky to have a good friend of mine who is a CPA here in uh, Canmore. His name's Todd Stokowski. I'm going to start annual 1% tax on the ownership of vacant or underused pro uh, housing in Canada that took place January 1st, 2022. Uh, this tax usually applies to non-residents, uh, non-Canadian owners. Um, that's what they say. However, this can inadvertently affect Canadian owners. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to owe the tax. Um, the Canadians will not owe the tax, but there could be filing requirements. And if you don't file, uh, the, the fines are really huge. They're like $5,000 per person per property if they fail to file on time or uh, $10,000 uh, per corporation. So um, it's a little thing that we had to file, but it's complicated to to know if you're supposed to file and uh, then to know how to go about and do it correctly. I know sometimes I use these terminolo this terminology interchangeably and I need to change the way I do. And Jess mentioned a couple of times non-residents. So you it's only relating to non-citizens. So you can be a non-resident of Canada, still be a citizen of Canada and um, this law does affect you in a different way. So really look at citizenship, not residency. So excluded owners are people who don't have to pay the tax and don't have to file. Um, affected owners are those who must file and pay the tax or just people who must file. Yes. Is, it's the registered owner on title right. as of December 31st. So you can be the actual owner of the property, but you may not be the registered owner, which is, which is kind of weird to sound, but because our land titles is um, in arrears in terms of registering titles, about three months, three, four months behind, you could actually be the actual owner of the property, but you're not the registered owner. So the tax is effective. Who is the registered owner on title and not a beneficial owner, but the registered owner. Uh, let's delve into that more because that is very relevant. <laughs> First of all, let's talk about dates. So, um, as we said, this was put into effect in 2022, or this was like, you know, brought to the world 2022 in June. And then they said, by the way, this is relevant as to January 1st, 2022. But really, when you get down to it, the date that counts is, do you, did you own this property and you're an affected owner um, on December 31st, 2022? But the dates are important. So as last year, January, sorry, December 31st, 2022, um, did was your name on land title, like on the title of the property? So as Todd had said, um, our land titles system in Alberta is, you know, three to five months behind at any given time. Last December 31st, it was probably about four months behind, which means if you sold a property or if you know anyone who might have sold a property between, I would say, I'd go back as far as August to be safe, but, you know, September, October, November, December, if you sold there, there's a chance that your name has not been taken off the title yet. And that means even though you sold that property in September, if your name is still on the title de December 31st, 2022, you could uh, be required to file or pay this tax. Let me clarify, no Canadians pay the tax, but you might have to file. Um, this is gonna be every year. So December 31st, 2023, if you own properties and you're an affected uh, owner, um, Keep in mind, you have to do this every year. This was supposed to be required to file or pay the tax by uh, April 30th, 2023 for any properties that you owned on December 31st, 2022 that is affected. But uh, they've just extended that deadline for this first year to October 31st, 2023. So the pressure's off <laughs> and you can really delve into this and make sure that if this affects you, um, you have time to file this properly. <laughs> If you own a uh, second or third or fourth or fifth uh, residential property in Canada and you 
own it uh, in a trust. And that includes, as I said, bearer trust agreements that you might have a corporation or a partnership, you could be required to file. And I'm saying could be because there's different types of trusts and different types of corporations and different types of partnerships. So the thing that is most relevant, I think, to a lot of us is um, there's a lot of people who own in their personal uh, corporations or their holding companies. Um, we also have a lot of husband and wives or uh, family members that own properties together that could potentially be considered a partnership. That Todd, if you have any further information on that, now would be a really good time to share that. So partnerships, the, the key thing is, is what's the definite, is a definition of a partnership? And, and partnership law is, there is a partnership law in Alberta. And it depends which province you're in. You have to look at what is considered a partnership. And really, it's 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 a question of fact. So everybody's facts could be different. So I can't just say, well, you're a partner and you're a partner. You, you could have two arrangements that look very similar. One could be a partnership. One could be a joint venture. One could be co-ownership. So you really have to look at the details and get some legal advice on that if necessary. And then look at your past filings and your past representations that you're making to the public. So if you filed a tax return and you put it down that you were partners, then you're probably a partnership because you can't, you have to stay consistent. If I was a partner of my tax return, well, you're par probably a partner for the Underused Housing Tax Act and um, and vice versa. If you've always been said that you're co-owners, then then that that's good. So um, unfortunately, there's no there's no one size fits all for the determining what is a partnership. Um, so on this notice that uh, the government have put has put out in regards to what a partnership is, basically they had three points, which says carrying on a business in common with you uh, with a view to profit. Um, so can we safely say that if people, if there's two people on title and they're carrying on a business through like a hotel condo or an Airbnb or whatnot, that they should pretty much go and have a chat with their accountant and or their lawyer and see if this is applicable to them. Yes. Or can we say it's probably going to be applicable to you? Yeah, because you could, um, I know I have some relationships, my real estate relationships. I have some that are joint ventures, some that are co-ownership some that are partnerships and some that I own when, as a bear trustee for my corporation. So I fit all of these. So those are scenarios that are probably going to capture everybody. And so you better just understand what your relationship is and what your structure is, and then come back to see if you fall into the laws and if you have to file a return or not. Okay. Let's say we've determined we are an affected user. So that is you have a partnership in some way. Um, uh, or the property is owned in a corporation or a trust in some way. In that case, um, if you are a, a Canadian citizen, then um, it, you being an affected owner simply means that you're going to have to file a form with the government. Um, in the future, it's going to be at tax time. Uh, so along with your taxes, but this year you have more time to do it. So it's pretty straightforward. You just file this form. <laughs> The form is not straightforward. I've already tried to do it myself. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm missing some hair. So my recommendation, actually this is Todd's recommendation and I, I wholeheartedly support it, is that if you are an affected user this first year, um, talk to your accountant. I'm gonna send out Todd's information um, and email to everyone afterwards. He's very familiar with this. If you want to you know, hire him for an hour or two, uh, this first year to make sure it's done right. It's well worthwhile. Okay, so Barb has a question here and she says, I also have a general question if the new tax legislation will apply to vacant land, whether it is a residential or other type of vacant lot. Um, Todd, I'm going to turn that over to you. So Barb, I'm going to ask you a specific question or I'm going to answer it in two ways. If you're a Canadian and you own vacant land, no issues you have. It doesn't affect you whatsoever, unless, of course, you're owning it on behalf of a partnership, on behalf of a trust, or on behalf of a corporation. But if you're an individual just holds on to an individual Canadian citizen that holds on to vacant land, you don't have to file a return. You don't have to pay any tax. If you're a non-Canadian, then that would be a different answer. 
I'm going to ask a question as if I could, by maybe raise hands, or maybe I'll just make the point. Uh, a lot of people have corporations. I have a corporation. I know just as I know other people on, online here have corporations and we all have different year ends in our corporations. So if you have a June year end and typically then you would get your, your financial statements and tax returns filed either in August, September, or any place up to December. So this might be off your radar in terms of filing this form by in April, because you're not, you're not, you're really not in that mode. You're in business mode. You're not thinking of taxes because your June, your year ends not till June. So just you have to have this date down somewhere to remind yourself or or have somebody remind you to make sure it's filed on time or because this corporation, the penalty, like Jess said, it's quite punitive, ten thousand dollars per property if you're a corporation. So if you own 10, 10 properties, that's a lot of money. Um, I'm gonna put a link in the chat right now. This link is uh, to where you can go and file online. Um, something I just found out in a chat with Todd the other or earlier this week was that um, you don't have to do it online. You can uh, do it in paper and mail it in. And that way, if you have more explanation or more uh, details that you want to include on why you are filing this particular property in this particular way, um, you know, I guess sometimes it needs explanation also. So the filing requirements, if you have determined you're an affected user, uh, means every owner has to file uh, for every property. So usually you would think it would be per property um, that a document or a form has to be filed. And it's not per property, it's per owner. So I know people who have many properties and they own it well even as Todd was saying and you own different things in different ways with people and the property does not need to have uh, a filing um, submitted each owner of each property has to have a filing submitted so okay somebody has just asked Peter has asked is joint ownership by spouse a partnership Todd I'm going to turn that over to you as well joint tenancy or joint ownership but I, let's just assume that it's joint tenancy so was the question, was joint tenancy considered a partnership? Was that the question? Well, the question is, is joint ownership by spouse a partnership, which could be the two different types of ownership, which is what we had talked about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, it may or it may not. It really depends on why are you having joint ownership? Is it joint ownership because there's it's a partnership? Then yes. If it's joint ownership just because you, you own the property with your spouse? No. It's not a partnership. Typically a partnership, if you go back to that definition, that was a great definition. It's a, it's a partnership is usually there if you're in business. If you're not in business with that property, probably you don't have a partnership. Just included that um, uh, link where I had, where I was sharing my screen, where it determines what a partnership is. Does it exist? Um, it, truthfully, I read through it and I was just like, I'm going to talk to my lawyer because I don't know. Um, it's not straightforward. It, you know, I had thought it might have something to do with, is it a joint Tennessee or Tennessee in common, which are two different ways to file your ownership on title. And it has nothing to do with that. So again, um, talk to the professionals might be worthwhile if there's any questions. One thing that I did the other day is I went, everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, if you have a rental property and you're filing a, what's called a T776 on your your tax return, there's a question on that T776. It says, are you, do you own this property with somebody else? And you say, yes. And then it says, is it a partnership or is it a co-ownership? So look at how you made that representation in the past, because if you ticked partnership, you may want to either change it back to co-ownership, or you may be deemed to be a partnership for, for purposes of this act, because you've always made the representations you're a partnership. Todd, we have another question somewhere along that line. Um, if you own property jointly in Ontario and one owns a second property in Alberta, are you an affected owner? So two Canadians, or that one Canadian sounds like has ownership in two properties, one in Alberta solely and one in Ontario with a joint owner. So for the Alberta property, no, because... That person's a Canadian. There's no filing requirements, not an affected owner. 
And then on the joint ownership property, you have to go back to, are you owning that partner? Are you owning, are you on title as a result of being a partnership? Can I say with some relative safety um, that if you are not running any type of business involving that property, so if it's not a short-term rental or something along that line, you're probably pretty safe and don't have to file? I would, I would agree with you, but um, I would still get legal advice because that's kind of crossing over from the tax perspective and, and saying from a legal perspective, am, am I a partnership or not? Okay. I would, I'm 99% sure, Jess, I agree with you, but I would sure spend a nickel and go find that out for sure. I think that's fair. Uh, so this is Barb who had... Um, uh, asked about the land question. So she is just clarifying. So an affected owner must file the form. An affected owner who qualifies for an exemption must file the form. But does an ex, uh, an excluded owner have to file the form just because CRA likes paperwork? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. An excluded <laughs> owner does not have to file the return whatsoever. Only affected owners. Okay. I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this question, but I would love to get your thoughts on that. So if you own a second home and you are an affected, you've determined you are an affected user, uh, you have to file only on that property that makes you an affected user, not on your primary residence. That's a great question. And the answer is you're correct. You okay. would only file the form and put down the property that you are considered to be an affected owner as. Okay. So you could have 30 properties and only one year affected owner just file the UHT return relating to that property. That one. Okay. We have another question here from Paul. Uh, if you could repeat which type of owners you believe are excluded. Um, Todd, I will say what I think and I want your uh, confirmation. So excluded owners are um, Canadian citizens who own properties personally that are not in a trust, not in a corporation and not in a partnership, then you are an excluded owner. Does that make sense? Yeah. If I'm going to almost be repetitive here, but I'm going to word it a little bit differently. Okay. If you're a Canadian individual and who does not own the property on behalf of a partnership okay. trust or a corporation. Yes. And we're we're always using Canadians, but if you're a permanent resident as well, you're an excluded owner. So you're saying on behalf of, um, like if somebody owns on behalf of the corporation, what happens if a corporation owns it? If the corporation owns a residential property, they are an affected owner and have to file a UHT return. There is no okay. tax owing, but you have to file a UHT return for every property. If a corporation owns it, the corporation must file um, and they are an affected owner. But if it's a Canadian corporation, they don't owe the tax. Is that correct? Correct. On the underused housing tax website, the Canmore Postal Code shows as being an eligible area, which means that there is an exemption um, for the tax in the uh, if the owner resides in the property for tw at least 28 days a year, this is for non-residents. Does this sound correct or do you have other information on this? Uh, Todd, keep in mind, Darren is a non-Canadian. Uh, Darren, if you're non-Canadian, well, I guess you are because you said you're a non-Canadian and the, your property that you are a registered owner of is in a eligible area, then that allows you to be exempt from filing or exempt from paying the tax if you personally use that property for at least 28 days in any calendar year. Yeah. So the, the and I asked the government for clarity on this because a lot of my clients are really close to meeting that 28 day requirement. And I asked the government is the day that you arrive at the property and the day that you leave the property, is that considered a day? And they would not give me an answer on that. And um, so I'm telling clients, make sure you're there for don't include the day you arrive or the day you leave if you want to make sure that you're relying upon that 28-day exemption. How would non-Canadians um, document that they have stayed there for 28 days? That's a very, that's another good question. And I asked the government and they won't give me the answer. So what I'm saying is just use some common sense. 
And uh, I find that we leave our electronic footprints everywhere. So we see our utility bills go up in that month that we're there. We, um, you're, you're going to Starbucks or you're buying groceries or you're filling up with gas. Keep those receipts now. Um, just because you have a boarding pass that you've came into Canada and you left Canada, that means that you're in Canada for X amount of days. It doesn't mean you're a property because you need to be, the, the terminology I don't have in front of me, I think it's um, residing or lodging in the property. So that goes on one step further. So we're here, say somebody's here for 30 days and then we'll go to Jasper for two days. Well, does those do those two days count? I don't know because you're not residing or lodging in it. So um, you got to really kind of hone in and, and be cognizant of it. But I think what I try to tell people now is go buy something at least each day in Canmore and it shows, I think that's enough evidence to say that you're, you're in your place. Well, I keep using Canmore, but wherever that property is. Yeah. I, I think you could also, if you have like a nest or a, um, uh, like a nest camera or a, a digital locks where you come in and out that, you Perfect. know, could potentially be more, information to support i don't think it can support it alone but i think it could help yeah. support your documentation that uh, uh you were here or not i saw richard, richard had a question yes richard is asking for husband and wife do each have to live in the house for the 28 days or does one person suffice that's actually a good good question yeah there's so many good questions uh -huh. um, either one you can't double dip though so what i mean there is if um both partners were in the property for 28 days. That doesn't count as 56 days. That counts as 28 days. But you could have one spouse there for 14 days and another spouse there for 14 days. That that accumulates to 28. And that does apply to uh, common law spouses as well. Yes, absolutely. And it's, okay. um, I had this question the other day, um, common law spouse, and that's common law spouse as defined by the Canadian government not in the country of citizenship. Things that you want to keep this in mind for is when you buy new property, how do you want to put yourselves on title? How do you want to identify yourselves in your tax filings as partners and whatnot? How do you want to set up estates? Because all of a sudden people are holding things in trust and that makes them affected users. Um, so for estate planning, it's really relevant. I, I definitely say get some professional help um, uh, before going ahead and, and you know, purchasing new property or, or doing some estate planning. Does the hotel condo rental pool agreement count as a partnership? Whoa, that's a good one. The answer is it depends. So you have to read the document and a lot of the documents would say, this is a joint venture, this is a co-ownership, or this is a partnership. Um, my guess is that it's not a partnership because partnerships, they're partnerships by attract a lot of liability yeah. because a, a true partnership, you're liable for the actions of all your partners. So I would doubt that the hotel condo is set up as a partnership, probably co-venture, co but definitely read the, the management agreement or your co-ownership agreement, whatever that is. What about full-time rentals and you have two people on title that may or may not be a partnership and uh, they are renting out a property full-time, but that could be considered a business. If you're two Canadians that are on title and you're renting out a property, if it's a partnership, the partner, the, the individual who is on title is an affected owner, needs to file the UHT return, no tax owing. If it is, if you've always been representing yourself when you've been filing your tax returns as co-owners, then there's no filing requirements because you are excluded owners. Um, okay, Richard's saying, how much would an accountant charge to complete these forms? Um, Todd, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, it, it, <laughs> here we go again, it depends. Uh -huh. So it depends on, on the complexity and the amount. I know myself, I work uh, on an hourly basis. Um, so it, it, it depends. Most of my um, returns that are going out are around $500 for, for a return. But a lot of those were either existing clients or people who had um, needed assistance getting to this point. So, uh, Todd, once again, thank you so much for <laughs> taking time on your drive home. And thanks to your daughter for hanging out there while you, uh, while you chatted with <laughs> us. I'm glad you didn't yeah. have any car accidents. Um, and uh, thank you for everyone for coming out on a Saturday night. I hope everybody is safe now and uh, will file a note to file.
a lot of people that don't know they have to. So you guys can avoid the five to $10,000 fines. Yeah. Thanks everybody. See you guys.